Hi everyone, welcome back. So this is another video in my series about the US Civil Rights and today I'm going to be focusing on the Freedom Rides. This is History with Zara Anderson focusing on the US Civil Rights Movement for the IB World History Paper 1 topic of Rights and Protest and today's video is about the Freedom Rides. So some background to the Freedom Rides. So after the election of JFK in November 1960, the Supreme Court made a significant ruling in the case of Boynton versus Virginia, Virginia, and that was that segregated waiting rooms and restaurants in interstate bus terminals violated the Interstate Commerce Act. Segregation on interstate buses had already been outlawed in 1949 and 1955. However, within the terminals, they still often had segregated waiting rooms and restaurants. Those, that ruling was made in 1960, uh, but of course this was conveniently ignored by many southern states. The Freedom Rides were initiated in 1961 by both white and African American protesters. They boarded buses that were interstate buses and hoped to challenge the segregation in, uh, in the southern bus terminals. They wanted to test out to see if the Boynton versus Virginia ruling really was being enacted in the south. Basically, they hoped that confrontations would arrive and then they would, be con uh, they would be captured by the media, pushing the government to actually do something about enforcing the ruling. So the first Freedom Ride left Washington, D.C. on May 4th, 1961, and it was scheduled to arrive in New Orleans about two weeks later. Now remember, these buses were ordinary buses with ordinary passengers. They weren't special chartered buses, they were just a Greyhound bus and a Trailways bus. They had the Freedom Riders on them, but they also had ordinary passengers who weren't involved. So the trip was scheduled to travel through Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and lastly finishing in New Orleans in Louisiana. Now as I mentioned before, the Freedom Riders did intend to provoke reaction from the Southerners. They always had at least one interracial pair sharing a seat, and they always had a black passenger in the front seat. Even though bus segregation had been outlawed, these seats were still traditionally reserved for white people. However, they always had one rider who would observe the segregation laws, so that if the rest were arrested, they could contact the organising group CORE, which stands for Congress of Racial Equality. So even though the Freedom Riders intended to provoke a reaction, they could never have predicted the reaction that they got. Trouble first started in Alabama, where Birmingham Police Commissioner Bull Connor wanted to end the rides through mob violence. So when the buses arrived in the Anniston Terminal, a mob was given 15 minutes by the police to attack the riders without any police intervention or consequence. The Greyhound bus during this time had its tyres slashed. It was followed out of town by a mob, and of course because its tyres were slashed it had to pull over. When they stopped, a firebomb was thrown into the bus, and the mob tried to hold the, co the doors closed so that the Freedom Riders would be stuck inside with the fire. However, the Freedom Riders escaped, but they were savagely beaten by the mob um, once they escaped the bus. One rider's injuries were so bad that he, were, he remained in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. The other bus, the Trailways bus, had no idea what had happened to the Greyhound bus along the way, and so it continued its way um, to Birmingham. When they got to Birmingham, they received quite a greeting. The police had tipped off the Ku Klux Klan of the area, and many members, including interstate members, had driven to meet the uh, Freedom Riders bus, and they were waiting at the terminal. They had the same arrangement with the police, that they had 15 minutes to do whatever they wanted without police uh, repercussion or police intervention. So what happened there were that the riders were beaten savagely with baseball bats and metal pipes, as you can see in the pictures. The riders who weren't too injured to continue still went on their way. The Alabama State, po State Highway Patrol was supposed to escort the bus to Montgomery, but they abandoned them when they got to city limits. Again, the riders were attacked. Even a Justice Department official who had been sent by the Kennedy administration was beaten till he was unconscious. Ambulances refused to take African American and Freedom Rider victims to the hospital, so the Freedom Riders were left to care for themselves. That night, it really reached crisis point. 1,500 people, including Martin Luther King Jr., filled the Baptist Church in Montgomery to discuss the situation. However, the church was encircled by an angry mob, and they were supposed to be protected by the US, US Marshals, but there are only a few there and not enough to hold off the mob. 
the leaders of the meeting feared a bloodbath and so uh, Martin Luther King Jr. contacted JFK who ordered the state governor to send in the National Guard to protect the African Americans or he'd be sending in um, the military troops. The original Freedom Riders ended their journey here at Montgomery, but many others organised their own Freedom Rides, including a young woman from Nashville called Diane Nash. She organised students from her university, Fisk University, to continue the ride straight away. However, she was warned by a member of the Kennedy administration that they could be killed on the journey, and her reply was simple. We know someone will be killed, but we cannot let violence overcome non-violence, and informed them that the whole group had already prepared their wills in anticipation of somebody being killed on the journey. Nobody was killed, and throughout the summer of 1961, other freedom riders continued to sit together in segregated areas in protest of segregation in bus terminals and on interstate buses. So let's look at the consequences of the Freedom Ride. The Freedom Riders uh, achieved their goal in that they had huge media coverage both across America and across the world. The Governor of Alabama revealed the racism of the South when he was interviewed on TV by saying, when you go somewhere for looking for trouble, you usually get it. This revealed the racism that was apparent in the South and also the social time warp that they were really stuck in down there. It also prompted Kennedy's government to take some sort of action or some sort of support for the civil rights movement because the growing violence was an international embarrassment for them, particularly within the Soviet Union. An important change was that signs of segregation were removed 15 years after the original Supreme Court ruling on segregation in interstate bus terminals. So coloured waiting room signs, coloured drink fountains, coloured whites only signs were removed and that was a great triumph for the group. It was good to see that Kennedy was supporting the civil rights movement, but he was re really wary of giving full support to the civil rights movement. He needed the votes of the southern uh, members of the Congress to pass some of his other bills, and so he didn't want to put his full so support behind the civil rights movement. And really, he didn't view it as a moral purpose as it should have been, more so as that he called it a thorny thicket to be avoided rather than his moral purpose. However, he couldn't avoid it forever. The Freedom Rides boosted the civil rights movement and led to events in 1962 and 1963 that meant Kennedy could no longer uh, avoid the civil rights movement. So if you're interested in learning more about the Freedom Riders, there's a really great documentary by B PBS called Freedom Riders, and it's catching up with the um, Freedom Riders where they're at in their lives now and, refle and reflecting back on their journey. So I'm going to put the link to that uh, in the description box below. Thanks for listening. See ya!